Today on chapter 13. All right, let's begin with prayer and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you for a beautiful Lord's Day morning and Father, for the health and strength ability to be here and Father, for the privilege and opportunity to gather together. We thank you so much for our Savior, the Lord Jesus, and all this is because of Him and for Him. And we pray, Lord, you would meet with us now and bless as we look at this part of this work from Hosea, his prophecy, and Lord, the words that you gave to Israel and Judah through him, and Lord, things in this prophecy that's, Lord, applicable to us even today. And Lord, help us to see those things and to uh, put them in our minds and hearts that might be a part of our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for giving us your word. We thank you for reaching out to us in your love and, and Lord, drawing us to yourself. And pray you'd work in our lives today that our hearts would be more open and tender toward you and that we'd be more like our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, I'll read chapter 13 and you know, a little bit longer, verse 16 verses, and then we will go back and kind of pick up. It says, When Ephraim spake trembling, he exalted himself in Israel, but when he offended in Baal, he died. And now they sin more and more, and have made them molten images of their silver, and idols according to their own understanding. All of it the work of the craftsmen. They say of them, Let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. Therefore they shall be as the morning child, and as the early dew that passes away, as the chaff that is driven with the whirlwind out of the floor, and as the smoke out of the chimney. Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. I did, not, I did know thee in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. According to their pasture, so were they filled. They were filled, and their heart was exalted. Therefore have they forgotten me. Therefore I will be unto them as a lion, and as a leopard by the way I will observe uh, them. I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps, and will rend the call of their heart, and there will I devour them like a lion. The wild beasts shall tear them. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thy help. I will be thy king, where it is any other that may save thee in all thy cities, and thy judges of whom thou saidest, Give me a king and princes. I gave thee a king in mine anger, and took him away in my wrath. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up, his sin is hid. The sorrows of a travailing woman shall come upon him. He is an, as an unwise son, for he should not stay long in the place of the breaking forth of children. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. Though he be fruitful among his brethren, as an, e as an east wind shall come, the wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness, and his spring shall be come dry, and his fountain shall be dried up. He shall spoil the treasure of all pleasant vessels. Samaria shall become desolate, for she hath rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword, their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their women with child shall be ripped up. You know, some kind of strong and hard words in that chapter. And uh, again, the Lord continues to speak through Hosea about the judgment that will come and, and the severity of it. As we begin back to begin the chapter, said in a thought here, it says, no leadership of the leadership of no nation or kingdom throughout the course of time has deliberately made decisions that in the minds of that leadership would result in the demise of the nation or the kingdom they were leading. You know, we see today, you know, various leaders around the world and and you know, we question sometimes the decisions they make and the things they're doing and, and you wonder, you know, in their own minds, you know, what are they really thinking about? And, and, you know, a lot of them are unfortunate, I think are egotistical and filled with themselves and I'm sure that has a bearing on the decisions they make. But in their minds, they're probably making a decision thinking it will, you know, promote, you know, their nation or promote their agenda or themselves. They're not thinking about the, you know, often the back end of that. 
However, history is filled with examples of decisions made by leaders that resulted in disastrous consequences. You know, if you look back in history and uh, the decisions that were made by various um, men, particularly that you, know, you take your Hitlers and your uh, other leadership there back in the part of the middle 1900s and decisions made to go to war and the thought was they was going to create a, 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 a nation and a, a kingdom, you might say, that would last for uh, a thousand years in Hitler's mind. And, and, you know, he was in and out fairly quickly. And, um, you know, men make decisions, but they don't think about, you know, the consequences of those decisions often and then the disaster they'll bring. You know, it wasn't any different with Israel and the, the leadership that they had in place. And, you know, some of the kings and decisions they made, particular spiritually, how they led Israel down, you know, the wrong path. And we've looked at that, you know, with Jeroboam and others that uh, chose to do things that were contrary to God's will. Ephraim, as we've mentioned this before, is often referred to in God's Word as representing the entire northern ten tribes that separated Judah from Benjamin. And, uh, you know, often when you see Ephraim, it does refer to the whole ten tribes. But here, it's believed that in this first verse of the chapter that Hosea is making a direct reference to the tribe itself. It says, When Ephraim spake trembling, he exalted himself in Israel. You know, in times past, Ephraim rose to the position of being the leader among the tribes of Israel, especially among the ten northern tribes. And so, when the leadership of the tribe or an important individual from the tribe spoke about some manner, the leaders from the rest of the tribes listened with a great amount of deference and respect. In other words, because of the position held by that particular tribe and, and what was gained, uh, you know, anybody there that was considered important, you know, were given uh, a lot of respect, and um, good or bad. Um, even before the Israelites split apart, Ephraim had asserted itself in the role of leading the other tribes. There were occasions when the pride present among Ephraim's leadership was evident. You, know, you go back to the book of Judges, you know, the, the period of time after Israel came into the promised land and you know, a period of time where there's a lot of chaos and a lot of people doing things after their own heart rather than the things of God. Uh, we see Ephraim and some of the leadership of Ephraim making decisions that were really not always the best. Uh, Judges 8 is an example, and, and their pride that was exhibited there. There were occasions when their arrogance towards other Israelites resulted in a poor decision being made, which ended badly for the Ephrathites. We see that in Judges 12. And so, examples in history from, from that. And you wonder, look like the, the Israelites would have looked back and, and seen and remembered some of these things and maybe it kind of tempered their thinking about the, uh, the, the folks from Ephraim. The first king of the northern ten tribes, Jeroboam, was from the tribe of Ephraim. And so that's really probably at the point that when the kingdom separated and split apart that, uh, you know, that tribe of Ephraim probably really gained its, its powers because... You know, if the king is from a tribe and, you know, he's in power and his people are in power, then more likely, you know, your kin people are going to get in power. And so I'm sure there's a lot of favoritism shown there. He made the capital of the northern kingdom in Shechem and Ephraim, thereby solidifying the tribe's place of prominence. And so we see a reference to Ephraim had the leadership. We talk about Ephraim having the leadership in a bad way regarding the, the bringing in of idols and the establishment of, of false religion among those ten tribes. Hosea declared that Ephraim offended. Oshem means guilty of a trespass with a view towards a punishment that is deserved. You know, so often you say, well, somebody did so-and-so or such-and-such -such was done by an individual. This thought of this word is that not only did they do something, it's worthy of you know, some form of judgment being brought about because of what they did or some form of punishment. So that Ephraim offended in Baal. And of course, the one they offended the most was, was the Lord. And uh, you know, the people themselves didn't seem too offended. It was God himself who was so offended about what was done. And um, even though the northern ten tribes were involved with worshiping God in an unacceptable manner from the start under Jeroboam, you remember it's a, you know, the institution of the false priesthood and, the, and the, the fabrication of the calves that were to be used to, to worship God. And um, 
worshiping God in a way that he hadn't approved of. It was King Ahab that introduced the worship of Baal among the Israelites. And we see that in 1 Kings 16. You know, Ahab, uh, of course, is, I think, influenced greatly by Jezebel. And uh, you know, the world couldn't stand too many of her. And, you know, she introduced a lot of things to Ahab, and, and probably he didn't have the strongest of character, and, and he, you know, instituted that among the people. That horrific decision eventually resulted in the death of the nation. Ephraim worshiped Baal in an attempt to achieve life. You know, that's what Baal is about. You know, uh, Baal was thought to be the one that gives life. But actually, in doing so, they rejected the true source of life, you know, that being God himself. And so, kind of a little ironic thing there. They looked to the wrong place for life, and, you know, the result was death. And the death of a nation and death spiritually, you might say, as well. The choice to worship Baal increased the rate of the nation's spiritual decline. You see there in verse 2, and now they sin more and more. You know, it's like one thing led to another, and one thing led to another, and, you know, it just got worse and worse. The result was an increasing amount of sin and increased involvement with idols there in verse 2. And it says, have made molten images of their silver and idols according to their own understanding. You know, whatever their mind hatched up and whatever came into their, something that would fulfill some desire they had, you know, they, they might create a God. They, they might make a new false God. And as we talked about before, there might even been competition among them. You could have the most elaborate idol and maybe their own shrine in their home and, and all that type of thing. You know, the people were really caught up in this. And the Israelites' devotion to their idols was demonstrated by the fact of kissing the golden calf idols that Jeroboam had made there in 1 Kings 19.8. And you know, in ancient times, in ancient cultures, a kiss was an act of expressing adoration and honor and submission to a superior. You see people today in you know, some of the cultures around the world, and, and um, one thing that kind of aggravates me is, you know, the, you see the ring that the Pope wears, and there will be people who will bow down and kiss that ring of the Pope. You know, and that's a, a sign of pledging allegiance and devotion, you know, to him and what he represents. And, uh, you know, and apparently these people would uh, go to that degree in, in their worship of their idols and, and of Baal. Um, such an attitude should be expressed towards Christ. And, you know, in the book of Psalm, in chapter 2, we see a statement to that effect. And, um, you know, there should be that same type of love and devotion, you know, for the Lord. Psalm 2 and 12 says, Kiss the Son, lest He be angry. Ye perish from the way when His wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. And so that type of love and devotion ought to be for the Lord rather than something else. In some cultures, kisses were thrown at the sun, moon, and other heavenly bodies. A reference in Job. You know, they were accused Job of doing all sorts of sinful things and not being willing to fess up to it. And, you know, Job talks about those who throw a kiss at the moon or the sun and an expression of their um, devotion and worship of, of the planets and the heavenly bodies. And... Uh, so we, we see that there in ancient Israel. Because of Ephraim's rejection of God and increasing involvement in idolatry, the nation was destined to come to an end. Therefore, they shall be as the morning cloud, as the early dew that passes away, as the chaff that is driven from the whirlwind out of the floor, as the smoke out of the chimney. All those things in that verse are transitory um, in nature. You know, they're here one minute and they're gone. And, you know, just comparing that to, to Israel. And um, you think about, you know, a lot of times you get up in the summer and there'll be a, a fog laying around and maybe in the low parts of the country. And after the sun's up and things heat up, you look around and that fog is gone. Or you, the smoke comes out of the chimney. A lot of times it doesn't last very long. It dissipates. And all these things are things that are here one little bit and then they're gone. 
um, back in that time when they threshed grain, you know, they had a threshing floor, and, and as that grain was kind of crushed and all, it would be thrown up in the air, and the wind blowing would carry away the chaff, you know, the light part and the heavy part, the, the seed of grain itself would fall back down to the floor. So pictures of things here that the people at that time would be very familiar with and create a picture in, in their minds. Now the faithfulness of God and His unique position as Savior is declared in verses 4 and 5. It says, Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt. And you're from the very start of the, being a nation, you know, God was with them. He's the one that you know, created Israel, you might say. and He's the one that called them forth. He's the one that gave them you know, good leadership under Moses and, and Joshua. And uh, from the beginning, and he took care of them, you know, as they traveled through the wilderness. And think about all the times that Israel got in a tight place and the Lord delivered them. You know, they understood that he was their Savior. Of course, he's saying he was the nation's God from the start in Egypt. And there was not a time in the history of the nation that the Lord was unfaithful to the Israelites. They could never point their finger at God and say, you know, you didn't do this for us or you didn't take care of us. They couldn't do so in truth. His faithfulness demonstrated in his care of the nation as they wandered through the wilderness. They were commanded to have no other gods beside the Lord. You know, you go back to the Ten Commandments and, and there in Exodus 20. And you were commanded to have no other god. And uh, so they had broken from the very start in the law of God. Hosea gives a reason why they were to have no other gods because no other Savior but Him. You know, and that's why it was so foolish on their part. It's foolish on our part to, to look to somewhere else besides God for the things we need. And you know, when we get in a, in a tight place or a hard place, you know, do we look to the Lord and do we trust in God in those situations? You know, Isaiah repeatedly talks about the fact that there's no other Savior, there's no other God but the Lord. And uh, it's like I got a typo here um, chapter 44 I believe it is oh no wonder I'm in a Jeremiah Isaiah and 43 it says for I am the Lord thy God or Jehovah thy God the Holy One of Israel thy Savior I gave Egypt for thy ransom Ethiopia and Seba for thee and then verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside thee there is no Savior. And so the Lord is very clear regarding that truth. You know, it's for the Israelites' well-being that they trust in God, because He is the only one who could take care of them. You know, that's just reality. That's just a fact. And, and it's just like one and one makes two. You can't, you can't make it any different. <laughs> and uh, no matter how you want to look at it or how you might try the truth is the truth. Um, Israel's continual problem was an issue of unbelief. And you go to Hebrews chapter 3, it talks about that. And the fact that Israel couldn't enter into God's rest, they couldn't enter into the promised land, was because of their lack of faith. And, um, of course, Israel there was setting an example to believers, you know, that we would trust God and have the abundant life that the Lord wants to give. God has blessed Israel, and the nation was filled. There in verse 6, it says, According to their pasture, so were they filled. They were filled, and their heart was exalted. Therefore have they forgotten me. And the word filled there is saba, means, means to fill to satisfaction, you know, to have plenty. You know, they always had everything they needed, and a lot of times more. And you we're that way here in this country I, most people you know we we have God's given us everything we need plus a lot more the Lord had completely met every need of the people you know the nation was pictured as a domestic animal that had been kept in a lush pasture where there was an abundance of nourishing vegetation growing and that farm animal was never without all it needed to be satisfied all the time and that's a picture of Israel. Instead of being humbly grateful and worshiping the Lord for all they'd done, the Israelites became proud and turned away from God. Way back you know, in the beginning of the nation, Moses had warned the people about this form of temptation. You know, I guess Moses looking ahead, God had caused him to see maybe that there would come a time when Israel would be in their land and, and God providing 
so much. You know, and the fact that there'd be that temptation to forget God and, and to become proud and think that, you know, we're the one who did it. I'm the one who did it rather than I've been blessed by God. And so what Moses had warned them about, you know, they had become. God had been a kind, loving shepherd to Israel. His method of interaction with the nation was about to change because of their refusal to respond to his calls to repent from their sin and turn back to him. There in verses 7 and 8. You know, because they've forgotten God, because they've become proud, he said, I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of their whelps. And then, I'm sorry, I got a verse ahead. Therefore, I'll be unto them as a lion, as a leopard, by the way, will I observe them. I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps and so forth and so on. You know, his um, interaction with them is going to change completely. His milder forms of chastening the people had gone unheeded. If you look back through Israel history, you know, all the times they would kind of stumbled up and, and rebelled against God, God generally sent some form of chastening. You look through the book of Judges, and often they sent one of the other nations in, and, and Israel would have a hard time, maybe be in some form of bondage almost to that other people. And then there'd be, they would cry out to the Lord, and God would send a judge, someone to deliver them. And again and again and again, we see God... Uh, expressing his love and his kindness and delivering them from um, the situation they really put themselves into. And um, instead of acting as a shepherd, he would treat them like a ravenous animal. You'll picture here the lion and the leopard and the bear and a wild beast. And what a, a wild beast would do to a well fed farm animal. You know, as a hungry lion devours its prey, so the Lord will devour Israel. There in verse, in the verse 8. Just as a crouching leopard waits for the most opportune moment to strike at its prey, so the Lord would deal harshly with Israel at the right time. You know, the God is not haphazard about this and his you know, execution of judgment. You know, God knows ex the opportune time to, to, to do what he wants to do. The picture of the fierceness of a mother bear who's been separated from her cubs is used to describe the fierceness of God's judgment on the way from Ephraim. You always heard that's a bad position to be in. Is you have mama bear on this side of you and the cubs on the other side of you. <laughs> and you, you don't want to be there. And that's what God is saying here. You know, you're in a bad place with me. And... Um, The nation would be completely torn apart and destroyed, as pictured by the end of verse 8, and rend the call of their heart, and will devour them like the lion. The wild beasts shall tear them. And so it's not going to be good. It's going to be harsh. It's going to be hard. It's going to be painful, that judgment. Hosea holds Israel totally accountable for the predicament that she was in there in verse 9. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thy help. You know, it's the nation's willful departure from the Lord, its involvement with idolatry, and associated sinful behaviors that led to its downfall. Instead of trusting in God to take care of them, they relied on themselves or on the stronger nations about them. You know, we look back in Hosea's prophecy, we see they looked to Assyria, they looked to Egypt, you know, they looked to other places rather than to the Lord for that help. And, you know, even the beginning of the nation, they talk about how proud they were and uh, self-reliant they became. God did not remove himself away from Israel. The nation chose to move away from him, their only source of real help. And the word help there is azer, and it's a word meaning to surround. And it refers to one who's the one who gives assistance, so the one who gives support. As used here is a reference to God, who is the giver of all material and spiritual assistance. And you know, we know from a book of James it tells us that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift that we have. You know, all the good things we enjoy in life come from the Lord, and all the things He does for us through His Son, you know, comes from God. And, you know, Psalm 46 1 tells us He's a very present help in the time of need. And so God is there, and He's often people don't avail of themselves of that blessing and that help because they fail to turn to God. They look other places. And, um, God declared that he would be Israel's king. And we see this in verses 10 and 11. The Israelites believed that having an earthly king would bring great benefit to them. You know, back in the days of Samuel, you know, they, they wanted a king. They wanted a king, and, and finally God you know, was not pleased, but he allowed them to have a king. 
Two questions were asked of the people to demonstrate the helplessness of the leadership that the nation had in place you know, at Hosea's time. The first question asked was, was there any other leader within Israel that could deliver them from the circumstances they were faced with? And it says, where is any other that may save thee in thy cities? You know, who else, humanly speaking, was able to bring you out of the circumstances and situation you're in? And, um, you know, the expected answer, you know, was no one. The second question was, what about the judges? In other words, those that assisted the king that had been requested by the people. The implied answer to both questions is none. You know, there wasn't anybody. There was no one capable and, and no one able. You know, human leadership, even leadership that is characteristic by, uh, characterized by godliness is very limited in its abilities apart from the Lord. You know, and we often forget that. We put a lot of faith and dependence on people and, and often, you know, not a good thing. And, you know, God does have people that he's raised up over the years that have provided good leadership in situations and bad circumstances. And, and a lot of times those people were people who looked to the Lord for his guidance and his wisdom. You know, Solomon started out really good, didn't he? And, and the Lord blessed him with, with wisdom, and he blessed him with the things that Solomon didn't ask for, you know. And um, unfortunately, he didn't end as well. Unfortunately, mankind has a great tendency to place faith in what human leadership can accomplish. And I think that's where we are in the United States today. So many people put so much confidence in the person who's in power. And, you know, really their power is, is limited. And God is the one that's in control. In the days of Samuel, the Israelites wanted to have a human king just like the nations about it. There in Samuel 8. At that time, Israel was rejecting the Lord's leadership. You know, that was a, really what was underlying their motive for wanting a king was, you know, they were rejecting God. The situation to which Hosea was referring involved God's anger was actually Solomon, I believe. You know, in the latter years, Solomon allowed, you know, all the wives he had to influence him in a bad way, and he brought in idols and, and the worship of false gods. We see that in Kings 11, 1 Kings 11. We see the division of Israel into two kingdoms as a result, and the establishment of Jeroboam woman as a king over northern ten tribes here in 1 Kings 16. You know, the last king of the northern ten tribes was Hosea, who was a wicked king, and it was due to his poor decision-making the northern ten tribes were attacked and defeated by the Assyrians. You know, Hosea was a puppet king. He was put in the place he was in by the Assyrians themselves. <laughs> Yet he chose to, to look to Egypt. He thought he could, whatever way, he thought he could rebel against Assyria, I guess. You know, Assyria was taxing him heavy. You had to pay heavy tribute. And for whatever reason, he made the poor decision to rebel against the people that put you in your authority, <laughs> place of authority to begin with. And... Um, that didn't work out well at all. Instead of leading the Israelites to greatness, as kings led the way to the destruction of the nation. And so beginning from Jeroboam 1 all the way through Hosea, we, we was not a good king among that whole bunch. And you know, it was just a steady decline down through to the end. And so God was saying, you know, through Hosea, you know, there's none left. There's none that could, can bring you out. And... Uh, then in verse 12, we see Hosea announced again Israel would not escape God's judgment. You know, the iniquity of Ephraim is said is to be bound, was bound up. And the word there means to cramp or to put in a tight place, to shut up, to make narrow, or to bind or tie up for preservation. And so, you know, it's kind of idea of, you know, you got something you want to wrap up in like a Christmas present and you cover it with paper and tie it with a bow or a picture of a bale of hay or something that's wrapped up with twine. You know, that's what it, the idea behind the term. It says, Ephraim was bound up, his sin is hid. Here again, the word there for uh, being hid is to soften. It means a, to hide something by covering it, to keep it in a secret place, to put up into reserve or to keep for safekeeping. The sins of Ephraim were bound up and stored in the sense that they could be they would receive their appropriate punishment in the day of, of judgment. In other words, there was going to come a time when 
all this would, would come to a head, so to speak. And, and what they had done was like it's kind of gathered up and waiting. And, and then at the proper time, God would pass judgment on all that sin and, and all that rebellion that, that Ephraim and Israel was guilty of. The evidence showing that Israel deserved the judgment that it would receive was kept by God in a manner where it could not be tampered with. In other words, you hear sometimes that evidence for a crime is put in a place where nobody can mess with it. And that's kind of the picture here. You know, God, God kept it. He kept that record. And so when the time came for judgment, if anybody questioned you, why is this happening? You know, the evidence could be shown. And, you know, it's here, right here for us today in the book of Hosea. It's very clear why God judged, you know, the northern ten tribes. Hosea warned the Israelites that the opportunity to avoid God's judgment was quickly slipping away there in verse 13. It says, The sorrows of a travailing woman shall come upon him. He is an unwise son, for he should not stay long in the place of the breaking forth of children. You know, if the nation was going to be delivered from the impending disaster, it must reverse its attitude towards the Lord immediately. You know, it was just something you couldn't wait, you couldn't delay any further. It, you know, it was something they had to take care of right then. You know, the process of judgment was about to, you know, to, to take place. And once it started, it would run its course, just like the process of childbirth. You know, once the pains of labor start, things will not stop until the process has reached its conclusion, you know, either good or, or bad. You know, not every childbirth always ends well. And that's the warning here in this verse. Ephraim is pictured as an unwise son who was in danger of delaying too long in coming to the place of the breaking forth of children. In other words, that phrase there means the opening of the womb and, and the idea of, of that child being brought forth, you know, out of the womb. And, you know, here Ephraim is and, and their state of sin and they got to go from here to here and they keep dallying around here rather than, than doing and moving to the point they need to be in order to be restored to God. A child who did not exit the womb would die. You know, back in ancient times, we don't have all the medical procedures and things they do today you know, to, to help with that. Israel's lack of wisdom and sensitivity to spiritual things had prevented the nation from repenting and turning back to the Lord. The result would be the death of the nation. It's just like that child and, and unfortunately that mother back in that time that would die. You know, that was the way the nation was because it didn't do the things necessary to, to, you might say, be born again spiritually. And uh, God would have been very patient and merciful with Israel. He'd reached out to them on multiple occasions in an effort to bring them back to himself. And their response to his overtures was an increasing hardness of the heart. Instead of, you know, softening of the heart, they became harder, it seems like. And they, they rebelled further and further. The, Lord, the door of opportunity given to them to avoid God's judgment was starting to swing shut. And so, you know, God's saying, you know, time is done. You know, the opportunity is over with. And if you're going to do anything, you need to do it now. Our judgment is coming. Now, some Bible commentators believe that verse 14 is a part of God's warning about His impending judgment where it says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. And, you know, Bible scholars generally look at these verses two different ways primarily. And we know that this verse here is the one that Paul quotes in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Remember, we looked at that back when we uh, studied 1 Corinthians. And there, Paul uses it in a positive way to say, you know, for believers, you know, God has conquered death. You know, He's victorious over death through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for believers, that victory is theirs through faith in Him. And um, But some of them see it used a different way here. <laughs> They believe the two beginning phrases in the verse should be interpreted as rhetorical questions expecting a negative response. In other words, they're saying, well, let's say, for instance, God speaking, says, will I ransom them from the power of the grave? Will I redeem them from death? And the answer being no. Even though God's prophets often spoke of His mercy in a parenthetical manner in declaring His judgment, they do not believe that this is the case here due to the severity of the language used by Hosea regarding the Lord's judgment in the surrounding context. You know, what we've been looking at here in this chapter and, and how severe God's going to be with Israel 
and they're saying, you know, so often, even in Hosea, we see instances where there will be a discussion on judgment, then there will be a break in a, in a short discussion on or offer of, of forgiveness and an offer of a redemption from God, and then a continuation on with it, uh, talk about judgment. And... Um, in other words, here, the grave and death will become God's instruments of judgment. They understand the Lord's final call to repentance given by Hosea to begin in chapter 14. In other words, they don't see this as a call to repentance or an offer of forgiveness. They see it as something other than that. Now, other commentators believe the opposite about the verse. They understand the verse to describe God's power and victory over the grave and death. This is the manner that the Apostle Paul applies to the verse in declaring Christ's victory over death and the grave. Most scholars believe that this verse is a reference to God's victory over death and the grave and also believe this application to Israel will be in the future when the nation receives the Lord Christ, Jesus Christ as their Messiah, when he returns to the earth to establish his kingdom. And so, um, two different views on that. And... Um, And verse 14 ends with God making a statement about the fact he will not repent regarding his purposes. You know, the phrase does not mean that God will ignore a truly repentant person. You know, if a person comes brokenhearted and contrite about some sin or whatever they've done contrary to God, you know, the Bible says he'll not cast them away. He'll not turn his back on them. Uh, that's what John says there. And, and you know, God's not... Uh, mean-hearted, he's not vindictive, he's not, not all the things that people often are. God is quick to forgive and um, where there's true repentance. And that would be out of alignment with his character, you know, if he was to do that. It's only if Israel would fully repent uh, in this last opportunity that his impending judgment would be stayed. Either way the verse is interpreted, God will do exactly what he says he will do. This statement is not a contradiction to what he had said back in, in chapter 11, verse 8. And we're there, he said, you know, how will I give thee up? You know, where God looked ahead and, and thought about what would happen and if Israel was totally wiped off the face of the earth. And God said he couldn't do that. You know, so there's not a contradiction there. At that point in Hosea's prophecy, God determined that he would not eradicate the Israelites from the earth. You know, there were groups of people, you read in the Bible, who were, God totally got rid of them and through judgment and and they they don't exist today no descendants exist today from what i can gather um in verse 14 god is stating he would not repent from sending his soon coming judgment in other words he's not going to just go on and on and on and on and on you know he's at the point where israel has hardened themselves they're not going to repent and so there's nothing left to do and um his holiness and His justice and His grace and His mercy and His love, all, everything about God, His attributes, always operate in a perfect balance and in a manner uh, needed to execute His plan for His creation. You know, God is far beyond who we are and, and how we think. And He always operates where His, his love is never compromised because of His wrath and, and His mercy never comes up short because of something else He does. You know, all of, the, all of who he is and what he is works in perfect balance in all that he does. There's coming a day when the nation of Israel will wholeheartedly return to the Lord, and at that time he will honor his covenant with them and restore them to himself. Regarding the promises he made to Israel, God will not repent. And we see that in Romans chapter 11. And uh, God will never break the covenant, his covenant. And uh, God is a covenant-keeping God. It's always man that comes up short and, and messes up, you might say, in that situation. Hosea's pronouncement of judgment ends with verses 15 and 16. It says, Even though the Lord will exercise His compassion towards the northern tribes, His judgment will be very severe. And um, the statement that the nation was described as being fruitful among the nations surrounding is used to provide a contrast to the resulting devastation that God's judgment will bring. Remember we said that the word Ephraim means fruitful. And so it's kind of a play on words here. And um, Hosea compares the invading Assyrian army to the hot Shiraco wind that draws the life out of every living creature. A particular vegetation doesn't have a source of water. And we talked about that you know, before. 
Just as the wind as would drive springs and creeks and rivers, so will the Assyrians consume the basic things necessary to sustain life just to meet the needs of the army. You know, everything that the people normally have to eat, you know, the army is going to take. You know, all the other things needed to sustain life, you know, the invading armies would take. There'd be nothing left. You know, they were in power and, and you know, the, the people they were conquering didn't matter a whole lot. The fruitful, and it said Ephraim, will become unfruitful. What was not used by the soldiers would be laid waste and ruined. The, wrath, the wealth that the leadership of the nation and the people had accumulated would be taken away from them. God's judgment would be particularly harsh in Samaria. It was in Samaria uh, that the nation's rebellion against God was promoted and supported. You know, that's where the leadership was at. And that's where it all kind of got started, you might say, and, and, and sustained. The city would be utterly destroyed. Human life would have no value to this invading Assyrians. Mercy would be shown to none. There in the end of the chapter. Even small children and pregnant women. And, uh, you know, an invading army, you know, they're not going to worry about people who can't take care of themselves because that just becomes a burden to them in their mind. You know, so they're expendable. They have no purpose and no, nothing that, no reason for their existence in their mind. And so, um, for those who don't value life, and you know the Syrians were that way. So, the reference here to the infants being dashed in pieces. You know, the soldiers said, "You know, I'll just kill the child. I don't, I don't want to be burdened with having to take care of it. You know, I don't want somebody to depend on me. I've got enough to do to take care of myself." And the same way with with you know the pregnant women. And. Uh, Hosea's warnings to the northern tribes are applicable to any people who consider themselves independent and self-sufficient and who give no consideration to God. You know, those who forget God, we see the result here and, and of that mindset. It serves as a warning to any people who fail to be thankful to the Lord for the blessings He gives and the grace and the mercy He extends to all the people here on earth. It was one thing that came to mind, and you know, I'm going to say something. It might not be very popular, but I'm going to say it because it's on my mind. We have two, I guess, kind of groups of leadership in this country today, by and large. We have some that will take us down the road of, I think, simple ways and simple practices, open the door to everything. And we have another group that wants to, quote, unquote, make America great. And I'm all for America being great, but I want America to be great in the right way. And, and the idea of being promoted is we in America can take care of ourselves. We're self-sufficient, no matter who else comes against us. And I'm afraid if, if that mindset becomes uh, too established in the minds and the hearts of people, that we will be just like the Israelites. And, and God's judgment will come. And so... You know, there's a danger, big danger in either, either side of the thing. You know, one group takes folks one way, another group takes folks another way, and neither one's God's way. And, and so we need to be careful, we need to be praying, and we need to look into the Lord.